Thank you all. Um, it is such an honor to be back here at Metcalf in more ways than one, uh, where my, re my work as a climate reporter started. And, you know, I've often joked that all roads lead to Metcalf, but this was a very specific moment that changed my life. And I am just overcome with emotion <laughs> a little bit of thinking back to it. Um, so, so many great people that I've worked with uh, have, you know, contributed to IC Change. And a few of you are in the room. And Jennifer Francis is in the room. She's an incredible historic figure, actually, in the climate science um, as it stands and it's where it's going. And I'm sorry, I'm getting really nervous. <laughs> Is, it, is, it me, or is anyone else hot in here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, is, it, is it just me or did, were my allergies <laughs> acting up? It's not you. Yeah, it, I know, it's not just me. But it, was anyone else having allergy problems this spring? Yeah. Was that you? Huh? Did anyone else notice that it was weird to be having uh, heat waves in Alaska and a Pac-Man snow game that you had to live in in Boston? Did anyone else think that was weird? Is it just me? Is it just me is the question that started I See Change. Because we're having these questions with ourselves, maybe we're talking about it at the dinner table or at the post office, but we are all having these climate conversations and very rarely is journalism or climate science able to answer them. And um, it's really difficult to narrow down into specifics, right? That's what, as climate science journalists, we know that. Scientists are, you know, kind of hedge away from the specifics. And when you think about that, when you take a step away, you realize that that's a problem of scale, particularly when it comes to climate. We're talking about averaging large amounts of time and large amounts of space and drilling down into one person who's having a hard time growing their tomatoes this summer. That doesn't happen very well. They, scientists don't want to do that. They don't want to be wrong. And when scientists don't do that, journalists can't do that. And yet our communities are asking us that. And if we can't keep track of the impacts of specific events on our daily lives, then we can't start to implement solutions. And when I was really kind of struggling with this was 2011, was a really interesting time. We were starting to see weird weather events and people were having this conversation. It was, you would hear it all the time. And I was living in Washington, D.C. And uh, I was actually in touch with um, members of the Office of Science and Technology Policy because uh, of a connection that I made here at Metcalf, having worked with Kate Moran as a fellow and interviewing her for one of my first stories. She was a, an Arctic scientist as well. And in getting to know these guys, I, 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 you know, I, I like to lob questions in. And so I said, hey guys, adaptation, what's the holdup? What's the holdup, Holdren? Why aren't we starting to do things? And one of the staffers at OSDP said, you know, Fundamentally, here's the problem. I can't turn to a congressman and say, this is how much climate change is costing your district. And again, it's that problem of scale, narrowing down into specifics and looking at the impacts. Now, science has come a long way in trying to figure this problem out. But I'm a journalist. So I started thinking about how I could innovate and invent within my discipline to kind of figure this out. I realized that we needed to connect the dots between the local and the global. And I thought, wow, we need a bridge. Something that will connect our local communities and our daily lives to the bigger picture climate context. What if we could meet the climate science and the data and the sciences halfway? What if we started crowdsourcing our climate change observations and questions over time? What if we could create a safe space for scientists and citizens to have conversations about what they think is going on, where the scientist doesn't feel the pressure of peer review. What if we could have that? What would that look like? Well, in 2012, I received a grant from the Association for Independence and Radio and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting to find out, to take this back of the napkin idea that I had and try and implement it. And they matched me with a, um, and, and so basically, the back of the napkin idea was this. Rethink traditional reporting. And I'm a broadcast journalist, thanks to Metcalf. <laughs> and so I started thinking, uh, I think of things in terms of structure, narrative structure. And when you think about a traditional science story, it doesn't begin with me, the journalist. It begins with the scientist. The scientist makes observations and asks questions. They answer their question with a research paper, and then they publish it. 
Now I, Julie the journalist, get a Eureka alert and I say, oh, cool paper, and I call the scientist up. If I have time, and if and only if I have time, do I go and find a local anecdote to make that feel more familiar. Now I know there's 10 journalists here who've come from their daily newsroom grinds and I hate and loathe to remind them of that <laughs> process and how the time crunch works, but that's how sausage is made. And I said, well, let's rethink this structure. What if the community could make observations and ask questions, just like a scientist? And then I match that scientist to their question and the scientist provides context and answer. This is what I think is going on. And then I, the journalist, report a story based on that conversation. What would that look like? What would that sound like? So I mentioned I got this grant, and <laughs> I wanted to do this in coastal Louisiana, where, I'm, where I live with my husband. And they said, no, we would like you to go to Paonia, Colorado, a town of 2,000 people in the western slope. The main street is, street is three blocks long. Um, and I think I cried that first day, actually, moving from DC. Um, but when you talk to climate scientists about the kinds of things you might see there, there not only are you going to see latitudinal change in a mountain community, you're going to see altitudinal change. More than that, this community lives by the land. They recreate in it. They, their economies, their farming, their ranching, their gardening, they pay attention to small seasonal changes and how it's impacting their lives. So <laughs> on, I just started off very basically on the radio. I said, what are you seeing change? And what's your question for a scientist? And we had a text message service. So we started getting text messages from the community about this. Now this was in March of 2012. I land, you know, got the grant. April in 2012, we started. And just to give you a sense of the t what we heard about this year, I'm going to play for you the Icy Change trailer. One, two, three, four. It's like the weather in Colorado. There's an old saying, only fools and newcomers try to predict it. And I don't know, I'm definitely not a newcomer. Whoa, suddenly we had dust on snow, and wow, that was a freaky spring, and then the next spring, and then the next spring. So something has changed. We've flipped some trigger, and now we've got this new paradigm. When it's this hot, I worry about how long our water reserves are going to hang in there. Farming fruit on the edge of the mountains like this is historically sketchy. We're really the first generation of farmers ever who can't rely on the historical weather records for our area to tell us, you know, what to plant, how to grow it, and all of that. Every year is different. So much different. This year, I noticed the first dandelion that cropped up was earlier than usual. There was about at least three weeks advance. The creek is hardly a creek anymore. It's just a trickle and it just gets hotter every summer. You know, we had one of the biggest fires recorded in, in history. And way more mosquitoes than normal. Ay, ay, ay. Fruit is really good this year. So last year there was no fruit. It's really exciting, it's fun. You never know what you're gonna get. For every crack of light, I wonder, do you bring rain or fire? Ask if it's possible to have a wildfire in Colorado in virtually any month. What was normal in the area? Who knows? How different is this? We're coming out of an ice age. We ought to be warming up. I don't really believe in climate change. Why, why now? I mean, why all of a sudden do they think man is causing this? I can't see that much change. Now, I really should go back because maybe I have evidence somewhere that I'm not even thinking about. My father kept a journal for 40 years and always had the temperature, the weather, everything. We have an icy change story because there's change every day. Nothing's permanent, nothing stays the same. If we don't love change, we're set up for misery. <laughs> First, people started reporting environmental news before it was news. People are experts in their own backyards. We don't give them credit for that. They know when things are right and when things are weird. And when things are weird, they will tell you. And it's up to us to, to pay attention and create a space for it. So again, the first week, 
I see change at KVNF Mountain Grown Community Radio, uh, who was hosting the project. And at the staff table, I was going through the text messages I had received. I had, we had started reporting a story on early wildflowers blooming. Um, we had started getting things about drought. We knew that there was not enough water per se. But then I got this text message from a guy named Doug. And he was saying, hey, uh, I, I think that the wildfire start, season's starting earlier. And I said, hey, guys, there's this guy named Doug, but I don't have time for that. And they're like, hey, yeah, um, you should pay attention to that guy. He's the fire chief. Okay. <laughs> And he wanted to know about something that he saw that but was unusual in March of 2012. You texted I see change when you were on your way back from a wildfire? Yeah. We went and did a, a day and a half worth of work at the um, Lower North Fork fire near Conifer. The reason that we ended our day is because we received about eight inches of snow. We still had some more work to do on the fire and it snowed and we couldn't get into it. So it was kind of unusual to have a, a wildfire with a full a team of people work in the fire and then have to deal with uh, eight inches of snow. Typically fire, fire season started like in uh, mid-May and was finished up by uh, July 15th. Uh, what we're starting to see now are fires that happen in the early spring and actually early fall. So you texted I see change with your uh, observation. What do you want to ask a scientist? Well, the big picture. just really want to see this a real noticeable trend. Ask if it's possible to have a wildfire in Colorado in virtually any month, not just May and June. Okay, again, first week in April he's asking these questions. Here's the scientist that we found to answer it. It's possible. <laughs> we have some great pictures of fires burning in trees over snow in December. Doug's observations are very much in line with what we've been seeing. Looking at the data for a recent decade, fire season have gotten longer by over two months, about 78 days. <laughs> and he was seeing that in California in the Sierra Nevadas. Now, if, if you recall, the fire season in 2012 was historic in Colorado specifically. So we were talking about this two months in advance. And that wasn't the only example. We reported the earliest spring in the history of the United States in April. Uh, we started talking about the drought uh, in May, and actually Jennifer Francis appeared in that story, um, we started talking about West Nile virus uh, a month in advance because people were not used to seeing so many mosquitoes so early. So we realized, again, that capitalizing on this knowledge not only produced broke news, but maybe there was even an opportunity for ecological forecasting. But again, it has to be put in context. So that's one thing we learned. But of course, when you introduce something new, years pushback. We were operating this in a town where half the community was employed by Bill Koch in the coal mines. So obviously we had, you know, to, but we opened our arms and we said, even if you don't believe in climate change, we still want you to participate. And they did. Um, we had those conversations. But surprisingly, scientists were not necessarily comfortable with talking about anecdotes with local communities and saying, you know, we're not really comfortable. And that was why we invented it. And I just want to play just a little bit of tape. Um, I was talking to Ben Cook, who works with NASA Goddard. He was looking at the Dust Bowl, and it was also par comparing the Dust Bowl, which was an, a man-made environmental drought, uh, to 2012. And, but still, when you get him in the room, this is what he says. Personally, taking off my scientist cap and just speaking as a citizen, you know, informed by what I do every day, I mean, yes, I think personally, not as a scientist, that the 2012 drought was as bad as it was before because of global warming. As a scientist, though, I have to hold myself to a higher standard, and I need to sort of separate out what I sort of what my gut feelings are from what the data can actually tell us. And the limits of the data that we have, and the limits of the information that we have, suggest that global warming played a role, but doesn't allow us to say anything definitively. I don't understand when is definitive. In, in 100 years? From a, a, a scientific perspective, yes. <laughs> that's, what, that's probably, you know, we probably have to wait 100 years and then look back at the data um, to be able to say, you know, for sure that, you know, 2012 you know, wouldn't have happened without global warming. So you guess. I, I, I know, and it's, it's, 
it's unsatisfying. But these are the sort of, you know, I mean, science is a very rigorous process. So I can have that conversation with Ben about his personal views and what he thinks is happening, but then what he can only present as a scientist. But very rarely do we have that process in front of our community when we're talking about this in, in the media. Um, so there was a citizen in Paonia who doesn't believe in climate change, who's very religious. Her entire family is employed in the coal mines. She's lived in the town for her whole life, seen every variation except for one, the dust bowl. But she noticed something very unusual about the drought in 2012, which was that the wind was weird. And she noticed that early. And she said, you know, just, the wind is blowing all of our rain away, and I've never seen it in my entire life of 70 years living on this land. And when I was trying to answer her question, Ben was looking at the same dynamic from his computer in Brooklyn. Again, he's my age, you know, and we're talking about intergenerational conversations and two people with very different perspectives. And I said, wow, I just wish I could get you two in the same room. Well, NASA flew Ben Cook out to Paonia, Colorado to have breakfast with Pat Polson, and she brought her entire family of sons who work in the coal mines to have that conversation. And it was not easy, ne necessarily. I'll play you just a little bit of the video. We have a 12-minute story. It was the most amazing two hours I've ever taped in my entire life. I wish I could show you the whole thing. But here's just one little moment just to set it up. Well, <laughs> I guess uh, we all kind of think that, that uh, Al Gore's statement about global warming is a little off the wall. <laughs> It's a nervous laugh, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me just let her complete her, um, what she was saying here. I think I could get it to 29. Well. <laughs> this is just the audio. <laughs> we all kind of think that, that uh, Al Gore's statement about global warming is Pardon? a little off the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Weather changes. It goes up and down. We have dry spells, and we have wet spells, and we have cold spells, and we have warm spells. And if you think back through time and know that, because we have the ice age, mm -hmm. then the ice melted, and so forth. So I think a lot of it is just we just have to live with it. Um, you know, Ben, it, this went on for two hours, though, like just talking about the science, the impacts, everything. And by the end of it, this was Ben. You know, we both come at these problems from sort of opposite perspectives, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, you all, you know, are you know, living the drought and you're certainly experiencing the sort of local changes in ways that I obviously mm -hmm. don't really know anything about. I'm studying it from a very sort of large scale, sort of removed level of trying to understand, you know, general patterns and mm -hmm. general changes. Mm -hmm. I think there's value in sort of conversations between the two perspectives. Yeah, if you get, if you kind of have an idea of what trend is happening and a little bit of an idea of how long it's going to last, mm -hmm. then you can kind of plan a little, little bit better. So they started off maybe here. We got to maybe about here. And it was really nice. And it was amazing. I, I'll, again, I'll, if you want, I can play you the whole thing. But the point is, they had, their new connections were made. Pat learned a few things, and Ben learned a few things. And that exchange was invaluable in terms of breaking barriers. Um, but there's one thing that, at the end, she says, is if you keep track of things, you, you, know, you can maybe figure out what's coming and plan a little better. Do you also remember from the trailer, someone talking about writing everything down? She didn't believe in climate change, but maybe if she looked at her dad's journals and she could see it. Well, it turns out that this community writes everything down, the little changes, the decisions they make. And this is an old tradition. They keep notes about environmental change over time. Um, and this is one example, Scott Horner. The way we gauge when to plant potatoes is when the lilacs are just beginning to get ready to bloom. And so we follow that. It's just really neat to connect. And I even on my notes, I'll say when I first, when I heard the first frog this year, when I see all oh, the first grasshoppers. And so when you put those kind of notes in, then it can give you kind of an idea of what we're trending into. And guess what? 
scientists are wanting this data. Uh, not only is this a, a phenological thing, and lilacs are used globally to measure like the beginning of spring, but he made a decision, an economic decision that had an impact. So it's not just writing down bloom times. There's more to it. But here's what Amy is interested in. The first really obvious biological signal of climate change is the timing of events. So we team up as often as we can with citizens who have data on the timing of biological events. So this is Amy Eiler, uh, who was at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab, literally a mountain away. But very rarely are these communities talking to each other. So these guys are writing things down, and everybody, including people who don't believe in climate change, are using them to make decisions. When I said, hey, how are you keeping track of the weather? I'm like, oh, it kind of feels like 1977. And they would literally go and get a notebook that said 1977 and open it up and show me everything that happened to them. But never had it been pooled, never had it been put online, never had it been integrated with modern remote sensing data. So I kept looking at the supermarket where they have three of these, three on sale next to the 89 cent M&M tubes. Mm -hmm. And if you open them up, it's not just data, it's stories juxtaposed together. And when you think about this, the Farmer's Almanac is one of the longest running publications in the history of the United States. And it was an adaptation tool. When people were coming from the old world, they came to the new world and they didn't know what it was going to do to them, so they wrote down everything to be able to pass that information on to the next generation. We're in that era again. Climate change is making things so different and we don't know how different they're going to be. So why aren't we writing down everything? How the weather, what, not just the weather, what it's doing, but how it's impacting our daily lives so that we can transmit that knowledge on and make better decisions. So we made a almanac. The IC Change Almanac, the almanac.org or icchange.org. Um, and we tried this out. Um, we took people's stories and their posts, their photos, their questions and their um, decisions, and we juxtaposed it to just basic weather, precipitation and snowfall, snowtell data compared to the 30 year average. And again, it was quantitative and qualitative layered together. Are we saying that there is a direct relationship? Not necessarily. But at least if you have the, all the data at your disposal, you can make the decision for yourself. And it's useful data over time with greater numbers. And we started this, and the most amazing thing started happening. People from all over the country started to use it. And all over the world, we get the most random posts from people all over the world. So we were two years in, we had 9,000 posts, and we're like, wow, this is really exciting. And not only was it working now, but it, we thought, wow, this might even be scalable. And I knew this because IC Change was funded till the end of to February of 2013, and I had to leave. But it kept going. So this was a picture posted of an eerie fog that someone noticed while they were driving over Vail Pass in September of 2013. He was like, just this is weird, weird, eerie fog. Four days later, epic floods devastated the Front Range. And it turns out that this picture was a picture of one of the, representing one of the highest moisture contents ever recorded in the atmosphere at that time in that place. Again, just really powerful stuff, but it lives in the ether. If it's not collected and put in context, then it's lost. So we realized out of year one, I see change is breaking news. I see change is breaking barriers between citizen scientists and both are learning. I see change can combine qualitative and quantitative data to document climate impacts. And perhaps this was a scalable adaptation tool. But we were on no more funding. <laughs> so I went home to coastal Louisiana. But I started asking different questions. The idea of near sensing and remote sensing. Again, NASA had been, I'd been speaking a lot at NASA, and they'd been asking me to come and present IC Change, and I started thinking, wow, we have all this data that's really, really small data. What if we could just match it to that big picture data? What would that look like? So I started asking people what they would ask from space if they could see their daily lives. 
And here's just a taste. Again, this is you guys have been doing coastal stuff. We go so. just about as much as the scientists right now, to be honest about it, because I mean, we do this for a living. Years ago, we used to have all of this used to be land. Mm -hmm. Well, all this this is the Mars land now. If I could get my pictures back, I could show you. So if there was one question you could ask NASA to answer for you, like in terms of this system, what would it be? Coloration. Uh, the open water bodies compared to the marshes, and and then elevation if that's available. And I you know I don't know if they can determine salinity. I doubt if that's an issue that's determinable, except by actual water quality sampling. You know, so. so this is in coastal Louisiana. I'm, I live in New Orleans, so I was interested in icy change among fishermen because fishermen, many of them have a PhD of the sea, and they notice change every day. When he was asking about salinity, he's like, well, you can't do that unless you're actually doing direct sampling. You couldn't see that from space. Well, actually, this is Aquarius Sac D, and it measures salinity from space. Um, but, you know, what's preventing fishermen from being able to access this data? It's not like you hear people going, oh, man, I checked Aquarius Sac D out the other day. Woo, it was salty. You don't hear that. <laughs> so, you know, there, there, there's an amazing amount of data that is being done and captured in, by NASA GPL particularly. They have satellite missions and as well as other missions with Goddard and, and likewise, documenting the, the history of the Earth. And we are invested in it. We are taxpayers. We pay for that. But we don't get to access that data. It is available to scientists to use, and they know how to use it, some of them, but a lot of them don't. Um, and really accessing that data is very, very difficult. I was obsessed. I was like, why can't we take this little data and match it to the big data, and I can overcome that problem of scale? So we had a workshop. And NASA had me and another person, Karen Nguyen, my partner, um, develop a workshop that we started calling NASA Data Bridge. And we brought technologists and journalists and thinkers who were interested in this data and being able to access it. And we sat in the room with NASA satellite mission scientists and data scientists to say, what's the problem here? What can we do? And we learned a lot. Uh, we learned a lot about how d data is stored. We learned about how people were wanting to access it. And we realized you know, a lot of this is a usability problem, a user problem. If anyone is familiar with technology, uh, the user is everything, and figuring out how to access the user. So we started working with them on that. Um, and thankfully, though, uh, there was one moment in this process, again, an off moment with the scientist, Karen Yuan, from the uh, Orbiting Carbon Observatory mission. And we were planning this workshop and just, you know, meeting. Uh, over wine <laughs> and she said stop the conversation she's like I'm sorry my phone's going off and she grabbed her phone had made a message and she's like oh it's my satellite calling and I said what just happened here <laughs> what do you mean your satellite just called you and she's on another couple missions and she gets a status update from the satellite when it's overhead I said why can't I have that why can't everybody have that why can't a satellite call me from space and tell me what it's seeing so in 2015, we are in fact doing that. IC Change is contracted with the Orbiting Carbon Observatory, which is measuring carbon as well as solar-induced fluorescence from space. And we are going to try and create a call and response network between local communities and connecting what they're seeing, their pictures, their stories, their decisions, to the data that's being collected from space. So uh, every 16 days, we're thinking, it's all in development, you'll get a message on your phone that says, hey, this is what I'm seeing, what are you seeing? And we're gonna move that data over to the IC Change Almanac. And again, collect this over time so that you can have that moment where you're in your daily life and you get to connect to the bigger picture. Because that's what everybody asks. Every IC Change story, every question that people ask us boils down to the same question. How do I fit, how does my experience fit into the bigger picture, into the bigger climate picture? So, this is our dream, <laughs> and um, we're going to try and create a citizen science network. I'm just going to go ahead and give you a, a slice, a preview of the app that we're building. We're also rehauling the entire IC Change Almanac right now to be able to accept this data. Um, this is not designed, so you guys are the first to ever see this. Um, these are just the wireframes. But basically, you're going to see OCO2 messaging you and saying, hey, what's up? Now, um, two things. 
uh, we originally, I originally envisioned like the same with the almanac. You have your posts, people the anecdotal, and then the quantitative data. But people really aren't looking at line graphs. That's not really how they're connecting, even though that's how I would want maybe people to connect. They want, they don't understand, they're like, well, what is that line graph? It doesn't matter. They're not actually paying attention to the weather feeds that we're providing right now on the almanac. So we thought, okay, well, what do, what do we need to do here? We may need to just communicate data more personally. So one of the, when we had a design meeting, one of our staffers said, hey, well, why can't we just have a customized personality to the satellite? Hmm. So um, this is what Beyonce might sound like if she was OCO2. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know if this is we're going to be implemented in the MVP, but we do understand that there is value to this. That, the, that data communi communicating in more personable ways might be better than just the line graph over time. Um, so, 15, okay. So what are we really trying to do? Um, if you think about traditional weather and climate information, it is one way. It's old school. Um, we are trying to create a two-way conversation between our communities and the data. Um, we're gonna be starting with this one satellite mission and if we're successful, we think we can do it with more. But again, the scientists are going to play a part in asking communities questions. That is the two-way conversation. We're going to be able to customize questions to our community over time. So when OCO2 is watching the spring greening, we're going to say, hey, here's what it looks like from our perspective. Can you take a picture of the trees in your neighborhood? Again, cultivating that two-way perspective. Um, we also see an opportunity with sensor data uh, cell phones are, and te cell phone technology is rapidly developing as are sensors. And again, how do we add verification into this process? When you think about an IC change story, it starts with that local anecdote. Um, over, with a lot of people reporting the same thing in areas over time, that adds verification. Sending a reporter adds verification. But the more data that we can use from our phones, again, that helps us say, okay, this is real, this is really happening. The satellite data is also a form of verification. But ultimately, we're trying to create what we think of as a citizen science story core. We have 10 media partners, thanks to our uh, funders at the Association for Independence and Radio, who have renewed our grant. And we're trying to scale what we did in Western Colorado across the country. So right now, we have uh, new stations who have signed up. I call it the Coalition of the Willing. Um, and we're really in a very experimental time. So we're figuring out what's working, what's not. We want to see icy change coastal. We want to see what icy change looks like in a city. And actually, KPCC in Los Angeles is killing it. They just launched uh, stories uh, about jacarandas blooming early. Um, they're doing some drought, amazing drought coverage. And the jacarandas blooming early in this year for their drought is a kind of similar to the drought that, patterns that we saw in Western Colorado in 2012. So again, being able to share knowledge across time, across geographies. Mountains talking to mountains, coasts talking to coasts. We have an incredible team. Um, we've added two more people, two more staffers. Uh, we have a former NPR editor, Laura Krantz, who's joined us to help uh, do editorial and partner management. Um, we have a couple Italian coders who've worked with us, and as well as the uh, NASA team. Um, so in the next year, we're going to be building, launching our app, the new IC Change Almanac. Uh, we're increasing our partner network, increasing the echo of all these incredible stories. And as you all, a couple of you, again, are fellows this year, um, what's the big picture message I want to leave with you? Is, and as well as scientists in the, in the audience as well, both scientists and journalists. I'm asking you to just go back to your offices and to your work and ask why not more often. Why not reinvent the traditional science story? Why not let citizens inform science reporting as a process? Why not allow citizens to inform the scientific process? Why can't we be more honest about the process in covering this or in doing science? Why can't we let citizens access science satellite data more <laughs> in their daily lives? Why can't satellites talk to people like they're Beyonce? <laughs> um, <laughs> the point is we know that we have these structural challenges and we can't let narratives or our disciplines get in the way. We've got bigger things to deal with. 